but uh, so glad to see all of you. And we are in our second week of just this little short uh, Christmas series that we have called uh, Home for Christmas. And you see my uh, title this morning that is it up for this message, Please Come Home for Christmas. A little bit of good manners right there and a little bit of a plead, please come home for Christmas. Uh, when you think of that home for Christmas uh, theme that we've taken, uh, we took note of this even last week. It's worthy of mention that the word home uh, is often prominent in so much of our, uh, our, our secular Christmas narrative. Uh, if you think about all the movies, most of the secular music particularly, uh, all of it seems to hone in on that word home. If, uh, if you make it home for Christmas, oh, I hope everyone can be home for Christmas. We'll trim the tree, you know, cook the goose and have the yam and all the stuff that goes with that. Uh, and then everything will be okay. If what? If we can all just be home for Christmas. And so, so much of that theme uh, exists in our own culture and it seems to steer our hearts toward home. So we took note last week, ironically, that most of the prominent Christian uh, Christmas characters uh, of the narrative of the Christmas story, all of them left home. They left home on that first Christmas. They either left home by uh, force or they willingly uh, left because of Jesus who was born the newborn king. So we focused last week on the, the Magi because they were the first to leave home. They left two years uh, on a two-year journey, 18 months of two-year journey. Most everyone calculates that by the way in which they would have traveled uh, to make it all the way <clears throat> to Bethlehem. So they were the first to leave. Uh, this morning, I want to begin in what I would believe would be a strange place to start a, a Christmas message, but I know that you are a patient group of people and will be kind to me and give me a moment to get you there. Um, <clears throat> right? <laughs> All right? Uh, so hear me out. Part of my text verses are about the person that we would refer to uh, in the scriptures as the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and he came with a great question. In fact, it's the it's the prevailing question that should be echoed through all of humanity. In Luke's gospel in chapter 18, let's read just a few verses here uh, together uh, with this. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the question, isn't it? What must I do? And uh, uh, if I just was taking this portion and just preaching this, I would certainly point out a whole lot of things, but the question is all wrong would be the one thing I don't want to miss. I want to say it and answer it this way. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> it's not in your doing. But that was his question. And so Jesus went with his thinking and said to him, well, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. He was wanting him to think about, you do know you're talking to God, right? You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And see the young man, he got real excited here. He said, all these I've kept from my youth. <laughs> I'm good to go, right? When Jesus heard this, he said to him, well, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter in the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? My goodness, you mean we got to shell out everything? Drop everything we have, we got to cash it in to follow you or we're not saved. That was the way their thoughts went. But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And then Peter got all excited. See, we've left our homes. We've done it. We, we, we've followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left his house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So the rich young ruler here was a person who believed uh, that he was a big deal, right? 
He's a big deal. And he is uh, really good at, at keeping religious rules. He heard most of the commandments, not all of them, but he said, oh, I've, I've kept them from my youth up, as if he's perfect. But Jesus quickly exposed that the young man had another God in his life and listened to what his God was, his own home and his money. His own home, he was unwilling to leave his own home and his money. That was what was ahead of God. Remember, there is a commandment, the first commandment. Do you remember it? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So he just, Jesus began with those commandments, but don't kind of on down the list as if by omission, he's trying to highlight it for the young man to see it. Oh, there's something that you're missing here. You're worshiping your own home and your money. He was not willing to forsake those things to follow Jesus. The young man went away sorrowful because he was rich. He didn't want to give up his home, didn't want to give up his riches. When the young man walked away and left, then again, just want to point it out, Peter, <laughs> we've given up everything. I, I, I cashed in my boat. I, I just dropped the nets on the shore and just took out after you. I've left home. We've, we've, uh, he's talking about the disciples. And we've, we've left everything to follow you. And then Jesus points out that that's going to prove out to be a pretty good deal for those guys, right? You're not going to leave anything here that you're not going to gain many times over in the kingdom to come. Here's what's silently being whispered and oftentimes missed in these passages like this. Watch now. Jesus gave up his home and his riches to come to our home to show us how to come back with him to his home. So he's given up everything. He laid down everything and he laid down then his life so he could bring me home. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said it this way, 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. It's an interesting uh, thing to just say, Jesus never asked anybody to do anything that he didn't already do or was willing to do for anybody. Now the idea is you don't have to go home and sell your home and, and empty your bank account unless the Lord tells you to. But that is not the criteria for salvation. The idea is you can't have anything ahead of him. Nothing should be in our life that is ahead of our love and affection and in following him or it becomes an idol in our life. And Jesus said, I readily gave up everything so I could bring you home with me. He has come to call us all home to himself. So my my title today <clears throat> is familiar when you think about uh, our, really our secular uh, Christmas music. There, uh, that is, Please Come Home for Christmas. Uh, a pianist in New Orleans named Charles Brown, not to be confused with Charlie Brown. <laughs> Charles Brown in 1960 wrote a song that the Eagles later made famous. Come Home for Christmas, right? Please Come Home for Christmas. Uh, we know that the song is about uh, someone whose lover has left and they're all alone and they want them to come home for Christmas. However, I want you to uh, hear some thoughts that I have about it so that when you hear the song, uh, and you can hear it on a lot of radio stations. How many are familiar with the song? Am I just talking to nobody today? Y'all know the song. There you go. I'm good to go. It, it became Christmas last night because I, I listened to uh, all of Alabama uh, the Christmas album, greatest album on the planet, greatest hymn of the faith, Christmas and Dixie. You know, April looks over at me. We're sitting upstairs in our uh, chairs in our bedroom. And she said, "Are you just going to listen to that till you cry?" And I said, "Maybe." You know, <laughs> it's snowing in the pines. Amen. Uh, praise Jesus. Anyway, listen to this song again. Uh, just to hear it, thought a lot about it. So I want you, when you hear it on the radio, you're going to think of me, right? Uh, you'll think of uh, hopefully the things that I've said about the scriptures here and gain something about it. I'm not going to sing it. You should be grateful for that. But I'm going to read it for you. Bells will be ringing. The sad, sad news. Oh, what a Christmas to have the blues. My baby's gone. I have no friends. To wish me greetings once again. Choirs will be singing. Silent night, 
Christmas carols by candlelight. Please come home for Christmas. Please come home for Christmas. If not for Christmas, then what? Just group participation here at Helpful. See, <laughs> friends and relations and salutations. Sure as the stars shine above, but this is Christmas. Yes, Christmas, my dear. The time of year to be with the ones you love. So won't you tell me you'll never more roam. Christmas and New Year's will find you home. There will be no more sorrow, no more grief or pain. And I'll be happy, happy once again. Oh, there will be no more sorrow, no grief and pain. And I'll be happy for Christmas once again. For me, I hear the heart of God in that song. Not trying to make anything weird. I'm just telling you. Maybe I'm weird. But I, I hear the heart of God in that song. Calling out to those who he loves. I'm reminded that he loves how many of us? All of us. All of us. He loved the whole world. For God so loved the world, he gave his son Jesus. And he came for the purpose of redeeming us all. And he's not willing, according to Second Peter, he's not willing that any would perish. But all would come into repentance. All would have eternal life. Matthew's gospel assures us of something within the Christmas story. When you read uh, all the, uh, the lineage where Matthew is pointing out that Jesus is the rightful king as the lineage of Joseph and Mary and so forth. And Matthew 1, 21, about this birth. Now you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. This is not a hope it works out, hope he can handle it kind of thing. No, he will save his people from their sins. But watch now, but not all will be saved. Not all will be saved. The rich young ruler walked away. Another gospel account said as he walked away and Jesus loved him. Jesus can love people and they still walk away. He still died for them, but they can walk away. Why? Because it's your choice. It is your choice. You don't have to wonder about the love of God. He loved you and demonstrated that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you, as Paul would have written to the, to the Roman church, but you can still walk away. The rich young ruler would not be the first, and he certainly will not be the last. Millions are walking away from Jesus' free gift of salvation that can only be found in him and him alone. Most all of us are aware of another person in scripture that we just simply call the prodigal son. Luke's gospel in chapter 15 uh, gives that. So you're familiar with it. I don't, I'm not going to read the, that text uh, today, but let me just highlight the story for you in, in case you're just kind of new to it. If you're new, by the way, thank God. We're, we want you to know all these things, but uh, don't feel bad. You don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? But you've come here and I'm here to help like the government, okay? Um, <laughs> The waiting father, <laughs> better than the government, amen. Uh, the wait, so the prodigal son could be uh, also titled the waiting father because you have a prodigal, which means he's, a, he's that rebellious son who he came of age and he just went to his father and demanded his inheritance. In fact, the scriptures say he says, give me, give me right now my inheritance. Uh, and he just gathers up uh, all of his inheritance, which was a large sum of money. He then goes to the far country. That's what sin always does. It takes you far away from the Father. You go to a far country. And what happens there, of course, is the boy wasted his inheritance on sinful living. In time, his luck ran out. The money ran out. When the money runs out, the friends run out. In his case, the women ran out. And then the famine came. And then bad went worse. And then he has found uh, not only his, his job an assistant to a pig keeper, but then he finds himself so hungry he's eating with the pigs. Uh, you know, for, uh, by the way, it's a Jewish parable here, a Jewish story, if you will. What could be more disgusting for a Jewish person to be eating with the pigs? That was as low as you could possibly go. Here he is eating the husk, just dying uh, of starvation. And the boy could have been singing the aforementioned song that I talked about. Oh, what a Christmas to have the blues. My baby's gone. I have no friends to wish me greetings once again. The father in the story, who is a picture of God the Father, could be lamenting the words of our aforementioned song too with a broken heart. Come home for Christmas. 
please come home. It's the time of year to be with the ones you love. So won't you tell me you'll never more what, Rome? Christmas and New Year will find you home. There will be no more sorrow, no grief and pain. And I'll be happy, happy once again. We're all, we were all once prodigal sons and daughters away from our father. But you know what? One day, just like the prodigal son, wherever that we were, whatever low part of life that maybe you and I had to fell to, the beautiful passage here, it just says he, he, he came to himself. Nothing more is given. He, and I envision it this way. He's eating the husk with the hogs, literally just elbow deep in the, the waste. And he comes to himself and goes... I'm not, a, I'm not a hog. I'm a son. Why am I here eating with the pigs when in my father's house has so much? I, I'm going to go home. Amen? I mean, my baby's gone. I have no friends. Everything is run out. But I'm not a hog. I, I'm just, I'm just going to go home. And you know how that works out. His father takes him and beats the snot out of him for being stupid. If you're new to the faith, it doesn't happen that way. His father sees him afar off and runs to him and throws his arms around him. Imagine how he smelled. But he didn't, the father didn't care. He threw his own robe around him and a ring on his finger and kissed him and welcomed him home. Why? Because he was just as broken hearted as how the boy had gotten. Both were broken hearted. Thank God you've come home. That is in part what it means to come home, to come home for Christmas, to know that home is where you find the love of the Father. I want to take my time, uh, the balance of time left today to help many of you with something that I think plagues lots of people, surely in Northeast Ohio, but lots of other places too. Here's what we know before I tell you what that is. We know Jesus is our Savior, right? Most of you could get up and stand where I'm at and, and give the gospel. You could do that. You could talk about how uh, <clears throat> Jesus left heaven on a rescue mission to seek and to save. That Jesus is the incarnate God, meaning uh, he's the incarnation. He is, uh, God has become, God who is spirit has become flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, he was born in Bethlehem's uh, manger as a baby. The miracle of miracles is God became flesh and dwelt among us. The angels marveled at it. The designer and creator of all the universe who stepped out of nowhere, stood on nothing, and spoke the worlds into existence has become a helpless baby lying in a manger. That should give all of us the wowsies. Jesus grew up and he lived a perfect sinless life. His public ministry began with John pronouncing him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was baptized by John, tempted of Satan. He calls his disciples to himself after 40 days of fasting and prayer. Walks with them for three and a half years, teaching them uh, all the things that he would be about and what he was going to do. And then we have our, the blessing of all that because it's preserved for us in the scriptures. So he dies on the cross, taking away our sin for all who would come to him, uh, believing that he's the Savior, putting their faith in him, repenting of their sins. And so he invites the world to himself to be forgiven, to be accepted and reconciled back to God so that one day we can leave our home and go to his home, right? That's, I mean, most of you could get up and give most of what I would say, and some of you would even do it better. Now, that message could sound like this, this time of the year, about that, now come home, please come home for Christmas. So won't you tell me you will never more roam? Christmas and New Year will find you home. There will be no more sorrow, no grief and pain. And God says, I'll be happy, happy once again. So, Pastor, what is it that you think is plaguing 
uh, so many people. Um, well, I'm glad you asked me, okay? I think many of you are not sure if you are home yet. I don't know if I've done what I needed to do. I don't know when I'll put my head on the pillow at night and everything gets quiet and still, sometimes there's these thoughts that come through your mind that says, are you really saved? Do you really know that you know? You know, what if you were to die tonight? What if you really were to die tonight? The pastor asks it all the time. What if it really was you? Well, in your heart, you start rehearsing all kinds of things, but there's just that plaguing doubt, and you're not sure if you're home yet. By the way, uh, you say, well, none of us are in heaven yet, but I can't run this long, but let me just say, God gives us his spirit like earnest money. He's bought our house. He puts his spirit inside of us, and he's saying one day, I'm coming to take you to my house. One day this house goes to the dirt and I'm taking you to my house. And the Spirit of God is the guarantee, it's the earnest money that it's as good as done. So I'll hit that in a moment again, but let me just say it that way. Um, are you home yet? Some people have no peace. Uh, they're religious. Man, this time of the year we get really religious. We got candles burning and incense and people are doing all the religious stuff. But are you in a relationship with Jesus? Others of you uh, are in a relationship with Jesus, but you do have some doubts. And you're plagued with maybe some fear and anxiety and doubt. Uh, so I felt impressed uh, for some time to bring this kind of message in this Christmas series. The most important thing in this world to know is that you know Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm not speaking about religion, uh, turning over a new leaf, trying your best, keeping creeds or disciplines or being confirmed or baptized or homogenized or whatever else the things that we do. Uh, I, not, it's not about, uh, again, doing your best, eating right and doing stretches or something, I, I, but rather knowing Jesus. Nothing more important than knowing Jesus. The second most important thing next to that is knowing that you know Jesus. Right? It's knowing that you know Jesus. Uh, now let me give a disclaimer as we get into this because many of you come from backgrounds that uh, you want to get a little sideways when we start talking about the security of the believer. In other words, you put faith in Christ and it's a forever, a forever deal. Now let me just clear a few things up with a few disclaimers just right out of the, out of the gate. Uh, first, when you throw out all the outlandish statements of defense, we only have really a very thin line that we would have to argue over to begin with. So thin, it's not even worth arguing about. Here's the outlandish statements that I'm talking about where people will say in defense of this, uh, you believe once saved, always saved, and that means people can just get saved and go live any old way they want to. <laughs> or what if you say uh, you're a Christian, but then later you say you don't believe in God and you don't want to be a Christian anymore? And then thirdly, this is usually an outlandish statement too, if a person just turns their back on God. Uh, most of that stuff is not really worth our breath. If you've put faith in Christ, please know this, you're not holding on to him. He's holding on to you. And that's where most of this just gets sideways. Uh, and people really do get sideways. Well, what if I just turned my back on God and said, I, I don't believe in that anymore, then I'm going to tell you, you didn't get what I got. I don't know what you got, but you didn't get what I got. I kind of feel like Peter when, remember, Jesus was preaching and saying some hard things, and many of the people who were following him went away, and Jesus turns to the 12 and says, you boys had enough too? You leaving? You going to go away too? And you remember what Peter said uh, about that? To whom shall we go? Go? Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. I don't know where to go from here. There's nowhere to go from him. And so when you really get a hold of the, the thoughts of that, most of the outlandish statements are just perceived and they really are outlandish statements. So I, I really would like to speak to you on what it means to truly be saved, to truly be born again, and how to know that you know you're home with Jesus 
for Christmas. It would be the greatest present you'd get this year. I'll promise you that. Uh, here's a statement for you. Salvation begins and ends with God. It just does. Notice that you're not any part of it. <laughs> it begins and ends with God. Man is the subject and reason for salvation, but man has no ability to watch, initiate his salvation, to carry out his salvation, to save himself or to keep his salvation. Salvation does not begin or end with us, but with God. Salvation is of God, not man. I want to put up a map of the Holy Land for you to see for a moment and help you see something and explain something here. So it's the Holy Land. Right in the center, you see the Holy Land of Arkansas. Right. It's really the truth. We have Bethlehem, Arkansas, and we have, you know what I'm saying, all those places are there. Uh, actually, I want to uh, mark a little place uh, you see there on the Texas, Louisiana. Those of you who went to public school in the last 20 years, it's the bottom part of the map there. Texas is the big one. Just kidding. Just kidding. If you can find it, amen. All right. But uh, this is not far from where I grew up, but there is a little town on the border of Texas and Louisiana, not far from a place called Marshall, Texas, called Uncertain. Can you imagine being from Uncertain? Can you imagine the forms you fill out, city? Uncertain. <laughs> you'd, ha every, you'd have questions, right? <laughs> All the time, people be questioning. You imagine joining the Marines, getting over there to Paris Island, get your toes on the yellow line. Where are you from, boy? Uncertain, sir. <laughs> you, you'd get a beating after you had the running, right? Um, for fun, I've thought about the names of the churches in Uncertain. <laughs> First Church of Uncertain. Uncertain Catholic, Uncertain Methodist, right? The Congregation of the Uncertain. Uh, I hadn't thought about Uncertain in a lot of years. I've surely made fun of it through the years, but uh, I looked up this week just to see how it had grown to a metropolis. So it has 94 souls. Uh, that are there in uncertain. But the truth of the matter is, there's a whole lot more than 94 souls that live in uncertain. Spiritually speaking, I think millions of people live in uncertain. That's your address. You got a mailbox there. Spiritually speaking, I'm mean, so ask about your life and your your decisions of all those things. Well, it just sort of you sort of get in your mail there at uncertain. So when it comes to knowing Jesus or what we call being saved, being born again, all those words meaning the, the same thing, there are four kinds of people in the world. See if you identify with this. First of all, there's the not saved and don't know that they need to be. You know, they just, they've never heard. They live in some remote village somewhere uh, or they live down your street. I'm not saved, but I, I didn't know I needed to be. No one told me that. Then there are the not saved, and no, they're not saved. It is H-E hockey sticks. No, I'm not saved. I don't want to be saved. I don't want anything to do with your Jesus. We're going to have party in hell and all that, you know. Rejectors. And then number three, uh, they think they're saved, but they're not sure. Those are the folks who live in uncertain, right? Maybe there's a few people like that here today. I, I, th I think I'm in, but I'm... Man, if I had a gun to my head, I don't know. Uh, number four would be saved, and they know they're saved because they have learned to anchor themselves in the promises of Scripture and have taken all of, their, all of the reins of it out of their hands and let God have it totally in faith. And they've applied those things to their life. Uh, again, salvation is of God, meaning it's not of man. Man does not decide. No man got up and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get saved today. I'm just going to do that. I'm going to go find God. Now, there are people who get up of a morning and God has put it in their heart to come to church. 
and he's drawing them in to a place they hear the gospel. That happens here almost weekly. We were, Pastor, we were just driving by. I, man, I, my blinker's on. I just pulled in for I knew it. I don't even know why I'm here. Well, I got a good idea why you're here. <laughs> God helped you to be here. But you understand, God did the initiating. You didn't initiate that. God put the desire in your heart uh, to ask questions, to come, to show up, to, to whatever it is. It began with God, and it will end with God. So God is the one who's always coming to man. He's reaching for the lost, calling them to himself, come home. Salvation is of God. He ordains it. He plans it. He initiates it. All, all of him. Uh, Jesus did all the saving by himself. He died for our sins. He was buried by himself. He rose from the grave. Did, did you, anybody here have any help getting him out of the ground? Right? He did it all. All of that was of God. He did all that. He demonstrates his love to us. He convicts us. He puts it in our hearts to uh, be convicted of our sin, to look for him. But salvation is his and his alone, and man has nothing to do with his own salvation. So uh, practically, uh, every message and every parable that Jesus preached is contrary to religious thinking of his day and of our day. Because here, here it is. Satan has convinced man that heaven and eternity is something for you to earn. And you earn it by doing these things. And here's the list and whatever it is. Keep the Ten Commandments. I love people who say that, and you've heard me say it many times. How dumb it is to think you can keep perfectly the Ten Commandments. I can't get out of my own way to keep the Ten Commandments all day long. And we always go to the big ones. Well, I didn't kill anybody today. Right? I didn't do it. But then Jesus turns around and says, but if you've hated some people today and had anger, then you have in your heart done that. And I go, guilty, guilty. But Satan's lie is do this, do that, do it well enough, long enough, and some way or another, it's going to be okay, and you'll get in, and you work yourself to death doing religious stuff and die and miss heaven. Because you thought it was for you to gain and no one else. All of Jesus' parables taught exactly the opposite of that. And then, of course, all of the New Testament writers are speaking contrary to that. But somehow, people sit in church and still think it's on them. Watch as Paul writes to Timothy. His last letter, this is right before he dies. Therefore, do not be ashamed, we add Timothy's words there, Timothy, of the testimony about your Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but sharing and suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling. Watch now, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Not because of what you've done, you got your salvation, but because God had his mercy and grace on you, and it's for his purpose he did that. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, and no one, uh, that no one may boast. No one gets to heaven and say, I'm here because I was just awesome. Oh, to know me, Wow. God was so privileged to have me. The church I went to, wow. No one will brag in heaven except about how good God is. And his mercy and grace, that's, that's what we'll sing about and testify of one for another. Because that's how we got in, by grace, through faith. Religion is an endless stationary bike going nowhere. That everybody gets on in pedals and sweats and works at and gets discouraged and gets off of and hangs their clothes on the stationary bike for a while. Then you go back to church and get on the stationary bike and ride some more. Did you notice this? If You never know how far you need to go, right? Now watch now. If you're, if you're just fat and you go to the gym, at least there's a scale. You can ride that thing for as far as you want to go and get off and go, oh, that's good enough. What scale is there religiously that you've done enough? Oh, you're in. You've made it. It does not exist. Think of the cruelty of that. 
Oh, but you keep riding, keep sweating, keep going, keep paddling, do all the stuff that you need to do, but who's going to tell you when it's enough? <laughs> Salvation and being at peace with God can only be found by God calling us home to himself through Christ. Get off your bike and just come home. Just come home. So my question today for you is, do you know that you know you're home with him? How important it is for you to know that? Let me answer that real quick, and I'm going to tell you how you can know that you can know. But why is it important? Because when you don't know that you know, you have no rest. You're just peddling, right? Peddling. The book of Genesis contains and illustrates all the major theological doctrines of the Bible. They're all there in Genesis, the beginning. And then they're played out through the scriptures. God creates uh, all of creation, and you see that in chapter 1, part of chapter 2, dealing with man and the fall of man in chapter 3. The great flood, God calling and dealing with one family. Interesting enough, you got two chapters on creation and 46 chapters dealing with one family, if not nearly 50. <laughs> Is God more interested than in the family? Or is he interested in just, it's just, you believe the creation, you, you just have to believe that. But then he says the subject here is, is this family. This family in which there's a descendant coming that will bless the whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ would come through that family. So in creation, you got six days. He creates everything that there is. And on the sixth day, he created man. And then on the seventh day, he did what? He rested. So help me here. Man's first day began at rest with God. I said all the theological things are played out in Genesis. What does that mean to me and you? Man to be in harmony with God must first, man must first enter into God's rest. Not all your efforts, not running and going and doing and kicking up the dust and look at me God. No, you go to God and rest in Him. And then you can go work for Him. Then you can do it. That principle is all of Christian service, including salvation. A simple act of faith. Christ died for me on the cross. I must go rest in Him. And I begin right there. Then I can raise up and follow Him in a new life. But I have to rest in Him and put faith in Him first. Jesus would say it this way, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are peddling that bicycle. You're heavy laden. Lay it all down. I'm going to give you rest. Jesus is God in the flesh who came to dwell among us and to show us the heart of God. Did he not say to his own disciples when Philip said, Show us the Father and it is enough. And Jesus said, Have I not been so long with you, Philip? that you don't know who I am. If you've seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father. Jesus says, I am the rest of God. I am the Father. I am Him in the flesh. And if you're going to have eternal life, what are you going to do? You're going to come to me. Lay down everything else and just come to me. Listen to these words in the right context. All of you who are trying your hardest to work your way to heaven with all your religious exercising and you're exhausted because you're peddling yourself to death, come unto him, stop you peddling, and he'll give you rest. We don't work for Jesus as Christians. Jesus works through us because we are Christians. If I'm consumed with doubt and I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven, I'll be of little good trying to help anybody else go to heaven. Imagine you're witnessing now to your friend or your neighbor, and, and you ask that question. Now, do you know if you were to die, you'd go to heaven, and the person turns it back around on you, and you go, no, I don't either. <laughs> I don't know if I'd die, I'm in. How are you going to help that guy know, or lady know, if you don't know? You, you're not at rest. They're, they're not at rest. It, it, you you're never going to be at rest as long as you live in uncertain. You will not have joy. Watch this, 1 John 5, 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I've written these things that you'd know it. 
You, you would know, not hope so, but you would know so. Watch now the, how you put this together, John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So in those two verses together, we, that you can't pull apart here, there are two things found in these verses. One is that you can know you can have eternal life, and then you can have uh, joy. They're inseparable. The fullness of joy that is given to you can only come when you know that you know that you're saved. And when you know that you know that you're saved, it produces joy in you in the weirdest of circumstances. Yes. Well, if they kill me, they can't eat me. <laughs> but if they did all of it, I'm going to heaven. And I can have joy. Yes. I can have joy in the face of, of anything. Inseparable. Uh, you want to find some miserable people today? Find the people who got up this morning and said, I, well, I got to go to church. I got to, I got to go down there and serve. I got to go shake hands with people. I've got to go in there and sing them songs. You know, I do see you. <laughs> Joy to the Lord. The Lord has come. <laughs> All right. Where is that joy? Not on your face, right? You find those people who pedaled a stationary bike and then somehow got it all the way down here to church today, and they're miserable. They're miserable in the singing. They're miserable when you talk about the offering. They're miserable when you talk about service. Anything that's mentioned, well, that's for somebody else. I'm doing all I want to do. You get to do what you do for Jesus. Some of you forgot eating with the hogs. Amen? How'd those husks taste? How'd you smell? How was it? And you, then you have no usefulness. When you don't know that you know, you don't have usefulness. Doubt is a great hindrance to God's people. Amen. Great hindrance. The Golden Gate Bridge took a lot of years to build. Man, generations ago. Interesting enough that when it was half finished, 23 men had fallen to their death, and the other workers watched them fall. Then they put a net up under the bridge and 10 men fell into the net but no one died but interesting enough they got 25% more work done faster because they knew if they fell there was a net if you think you're holding on to your own salvation you're not going to be very productive but if you know you're not holding on to God but he's holding on to you and he is always your net and you know you're not going to fall, you'll be a whole lot more productive as you go through the Christian life. We cannot work effectively for God if we're always uncertain where we live. It's hard to fight or resist the devil until you're certain of your opponent. So, just to finish this morning, so how can I know? <laughs> how can I know that I know Jesus? Well, I don't know of anything better than the testimony of the Bible. If you got something better, let me know. We have the eternal word of God that we put our faith and promises in. Again, 1 John 5, 13, I write these things, that, things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Is that you? Do you believe? Have you put your faith and trust wholly in Christ and His finished work on the cross or do you think, yeah, but it's plus a little something else that I got to do? I've written these things for you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. As soon as you inject your own efforts into something, if you think that be the truth, then you can never know. By the way, you could work your way into heaven. I should clarify. If you've been perfect up till today, and you can be perfect till you die, you can go to heaven. In fact, heck, you may even be the Savior. Right? But there was only one person who could do that, and he did it. And we go on his merits by putting faith in him because he was the perfect man, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Again, I've said this before, if I left you a road map and said, I'm inviting you to my house Friday night, 7 o'clock, I'm cooking supper, I'll have it ready, you be there at 7 o'clock, don't use the Google map because it'll get you down a wrong road. I've written you a map, 
handwritten it myself. Turn here, turn there, do this, do that, all the, everything you need to get there. And you get that map from me, and you chunk it in the bottom of the floorboard and ride around for another week and put it in the glove box or throw it out the window or whatever it is that you do. And 7 o'clock Friday night rolls around and you're not at my house because you can't find the map or can't get there or don't know what to do or went ahead and tried to do it on the computer. Tell me, is it your fault or my fault that you didn't make it to my house? It'd be your fault, would it not? What, what are we going to do, stand before God and say, you didn't tell us? I've written these things that you would know. I've showed you so you would know. I've told you so you would know. Your Bible riding around in the dashboard or can't find it at the house. Your fault or his fault. By the way, Romans 10, 9 and 10, because if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Wow. Did he mean that? For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Why is it we can't put faith in the Word of God to be one with Christ and one with God and know that we know when we do the same thing when we get married? Do you want this woman? Uh, yeah, well then here's, here's what you need to say. You'll have her, you'll hold her, you'll love her, you'll honor and cherish her. You'll forsake all others. You'll, you'll do everything, rich or poor, better or worse. You, you'll have her to be your wife. I, I'll do it. I'm in. And then she says her part, and then you've both confessed with your mouth what your heart desired to do, and you're married. I, you know, you go to people and go, hey, are you married? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I just don't know. I mean, we were at church, and we said some things, but I don't... I mean, she came home with me. You know, well, are you married? I, 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 I'm uncertain. You, you either said it and believed it and wanted her, or him, or you didn't. You're married or you're not. But with salvation, we're just... Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. The Spirit of God reproves us of our sin. That means He convicts us. Then He regenerates us. We're born again. We're regenerated in this new life. And then He resides in us. Right? Because this is the, the, this, the second thing here is the witness of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that I know? I've got the Bible that tells me. And then the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He literally... He, he reproves you, regenerates you, and then He resides in you. Did, did someone move in your house? Well, I don't know. Did you hear the garage door? Is there water running? Do you hear somebody milling around in the kitchen? Uh, you'd have to know if somebody moved in your house. The Spirit of God, according to the Word of God, moves in. When you say, I've invited Jesus into my heart, I've prayed and received Jesus, what you've received is... The, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, all the same person. The third person of the, the Trinity is the Spirit of God. And by His Spirit, He's the earnest money that says, I have bought your house. One day your house is going to go down, but I'm taking you to my house and moving you into my house. And by my Spirit, you know this to be true. It's good. Contractually, we're done. When you've put faith in me, I've received you to myself. That's what happens. Watching, uh, well, for time's sake, let me just, I think you got that one. There's a change of attitude. 1 John three fourteen. we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. One of the greatest evidences of salvation is the simple fact that we're not the men and women we used to be. We're different. If you tell me you know Christ, what changed? Because everything should change when you receive Him. Your attitude would be different. Your view of other people will be different. You don't no longer have to kill everybody. They didn't do everything like you. You're different. Ephesians 2, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. What was your life before Christ? Dead. Dead in your own sins. Good as dead. 
in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The spirit uh, that he's talking about, not the spirit of God, but the prince of the power of the air is the demonic influences of, of Satan in this world that keeps people going down religious paths to nowhere or living in their sin, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our own flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and mind. How did you live before you were saved? Like a dog. Wherever a dog wanted to go and do his business and all the things he'd, you just live like a dog. I get up for me, live for me, do what I want to do, and I live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Watch verse 4. But God. <laughs> in the middle of that life, God intersects himself into it, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for you, right? Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You don't have to live like a dog anymore. If you still live like a dog, tell me how'd that happen? If you're supposed to get got a new life by his mercy and great love. Then there's a change of desire. 1 John 2, 15, Do not love the world or the things in this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Hey, Jesus is coming. Could be today. What does that do to your heart? Oh, I've got my stuff. I've got things. I've got... Are you anchored to your stuff like the rich young ruler? I don't leave my home. I don't want to leave my riches. I'm anchored here. Listen, you should have a change of desire if you know him. When we say he may be coming today, I look, it all should quicken our hearts. I get that. But it ought to be an expectation of, wow, I hope it's today. The wonder of all that. That change of desire. Do not love the world. Romans 7, 22, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. When the word of God is going out, you go, oh, man. Give me some more of that. Give me some more of that. Romans 6, I, I just mark it that you can look at it later. Verses 3 through 6. Listen, we're baptized in Christ. We're all those things. The verse 6, we know that our old self is crucified. I died. I died with him. That, that, that body is gone. That old man of sin is gone and it's brought to nothing. I'm not enslaved by that anymore. Some people will do what they want to do. And they'll say that, well, if you get saved and you believe once saved, always saved, you just live any way you want to. That's true. But my want to has greatly changed. <laughs> I don't run with the people I used to run with. As that old saying goes, I don't smoke, drink, or chew, or run with the women who do. <laughs> All right. Everything changed. And watch the last one, inward peace. Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not that the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. He started that passage off saying that same thing. Let your, not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He caps off that chapter right here with these, these words again. Let not your heart be troubled again. Neither let them uh, be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away. I'll come to you. If, I'll love, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. But I'm going there to make a place for you. I'm going to my Father's house to make a room so you'll have a place to call home. And a seat at the table. This to me is the issue. Do you have peace today? I mean, you really have peace? Does the peace of God rule and reign in our lives? Jesus is telling his disciples he's leaving them, but he was going to leave them with his peace through the power of the Spirit of God. If you know him, you should have peace in your heart about that. It doesn't mean we're not going to have trials or difficulties, but in the midst of all of it, there's this calming peace. I know what it is to about die. And have peace ushered in at the same time. Just peace. Do you know that you know Jesus? You surely have seen this phrasing before. N-O Jesus, no peace. 
K-N-O-W, Jesus, you can know peace. This is the message for you today from God's precious Holy Spirit. Please come home for Christmas. If you're not home, he wants you to be home. Come home for Christmas. There will be no more sorrow, no grief and pain, and I'll be happy, happy once again. Knowing that you know you're home for Christmas, that's where the presence is at. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes for just a few moments. And I have an opportunity here for a response of all that you've heard. Listen, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're, particularly if you're living in uncertain, there's no doubt we better have some people here who do not know Christ as Savior, but probably most people in the, a crowd at church, uh, you would believe that. But do you know that you know? Are you still living in some of that doubt, pedaling the bicycle, so to speak, religiously? No rest, no peace. Hard to be effective in your work. I'm not going to have you raise your hands, but in your heart, lift it up to the Lord. And just tell Him, I don't want to live in uncertainty anymore. If you're here and you don't know Christ, you know that you don't know. <laughs> Or you need to firm that up because you're unsure. I think it looks the same. Release everything else in your life of your own effort and fall on the mercy of God. Confess that you're a sinner. Confess that you know He loves you and you desire to know and love Him. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. You need help wording a a prayer like that let me offer this prayer you could pray it behind me you don't have to pray it out loud but out of your heart pray like this dear God I do believe that you love me thank you for loving me I believe that you came in the person of Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem's manger lived a perfect sinless life and you died on the cross and you died for my sins Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Make me one with you. I'm putting my faith in you the best I know how. I'm letting go of everything else. Forgive me of my religious peddling and efforts. I'm laying that down and trusting wholly in you. I'm asking it by faith, and I'm asking it in Jesus' name. <laughs>